Aspasia of Miletus, a practiced, influential teacher and scholar of rhetoric by Morgan Didion. In the discipline of rhetoric and composition, scholars are working to include women in the early beginnings of rhetorical theory. In the classical beginning of this discipline, big thinkers such as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Cicero, and even Homer easily come to mind. A new thought, however, exists that women too have their place in this historical timeline. A major contributor to the argument that women should be worked into our discipline's early history is Aspasia of Miletus. Though she has no surviving primary documents of her own, Aspasia's rhetorical influence is exemplified through infamous texts by Plato, Cicero, and Eschines. Through these texts, Aspasia's role as practitioner and teacher of rhetoric is made clear. She undoubtedly influenced Socrates as he positively attributes much of his own knowledge and skill in rhetoric to her. Asp <clears throat> Aspasia used a model of teaching as a peer to influence Socrates and other rhetorical theory peers, a model similar to models that educators use in classrooms today. Aspasia's influence on the rhetoric and composition discipline through her own use of rhetoric and her teachings to peers is unsurpassable and her value should definitely be worked into rhetoric classrooms and discussions today. Aspasia was born in Miletus, now Turkey, as the daughter of Aesiochus. Around 440 BCE, Aspasia relocated to Athens and lived with the famous political leader Pericles, who is said to be her lover, though she could not marry him because she was a foreigner. Due to her status as foreigner and woman, Aspasia had limited social roles available to her during this time in Athens. For this reason, it is believed that Aspasia was a hetera, a form of better educated or more expensive Greek prostitute. Aspasia then became Pericles' concubine, who lived an interesting life in his home. Famous philosopher Plutarch explained that Aspasia's home was a location for philosophical and rhetorical conversations in mixed company. Despite being a hetera, a foreigner, and a woman, Aspasia managed to influence great Athenian men through her rhetorical prowess. Greek women during this time were not respected in the public domain beyond being wives or prostitutes. However, as Cheryl Glenn says in her essay titled, Sex, Lies, and Manuscript, Refiguring Aspasia in the History of Rhetoric, few women participated in the intellectual life of ancient Greece. Aspasia was a striking exception. Though no primary texts of her own survive, Aspasia's rhetorical and pedagogical influence is seen through the major surviving texts of Plato's Menexenus, Cicero's De Inventione, Athenius's Dipnosophiste, and Aeschines' Aspasia. Each of these texts serve to prove that Aspasia earned her place in the rhetoric and composition discipline through both her rhetorical skills and practices in rhetorical pedagogy. First, Aspasia's place in our discipline's history is important simply because she was a woman who defined standard gendered roles in her time period in order to make a mark on rhetoric's development. Glenn argues heavily for the inclusion of Aspasia and other women in rhetoric's history, saying, for the story of her intellectual contributions to rhetoric may suggest the existence of an unrecognized subculture within that community, and the artistic and literary uses of Aspasia of Miletus may configure an emblem of woman in rhetorical history. This means that Glenn believes that researching Aspasia may even highlight other women who broke out of the domestic sphere during this time. Additionally, Glenn says that the lack of primary texts of Aspasia is not an issue because the fact that Aspasia is even mentioned by her male contemporaries is remarkable for rare is the mention of any intellectual woman. Agreeing with Glenn, in her work titled Prisoner of History, Aspasia of Miletus and Her Biographical Tradition is Madeline Henry, who says Aspasia remains a site for the reinscription of Athenian history. Henry also thinks of Aspasia remarkably 
as a groundbreaking female rhetorician in classical Greece. Like Glenn, Henry believes that Aspasia's mere inclusion in male text is important, saying that the use of Aspasia's name, the creation of a persona for her in this very masculinist discourse, and the representations of her speech all require special attention. Aspasia's wit and knowledge in classical Greece is astonishing, especially because for the past 2,500 years in Western culture, the ideal woman has been disciplined by cultural codes that require a closed mouth, silence, a closed body, chastity, and an enclosed life, domestic confinement. And Aspasia definitely broke away from these obstacles. Besides being an educated woman during this time, Aspasia truly did possess skill in rhetoric that makes her memorable, whether she was a woman or not. A significant a significant example of Aspasia's skill in rhetoric occurs in Plato's Menexenus. Glenn states that Menexenus contains further recognition of Aspasia's reputation as a rhetorician, philo <clears throat> philosopher, and as an influential colleague in the Sophistic movement, a movement devoted to the analysis and creation of rhetoric and of truth. Indeed, the Menexenus shows Aspasia's accomplishment in rhetoric, as Plato Socrates explains Aspasia as his great mi mistress in rhetoric. Two scholars in rhetoric, Kate Ronald and Joy Ritchie, also explain Aspasia's influence in the Menexenus in their essay titled An Anthology of Women's Rhetoric, Aspasia. Ronald and Ritchie quote that Plato suggests that Aspasia herself, not Pericles, wrote the famous funeral oration for those killed in the Peloponnesian Wars in 431 BCE, and that what Pericles spoke, she, Aspasia, composed. Aspasia authoring the famous funeral oration is monumental, as this was one of the most famous speeches of the time, and it was composed by a woman. Ronald and Ritchie explain how this speech used strong tactics of rhetoric, saying Socrates attributes its oration uh, ideas of public good and of the connection of place and people, as well as the oration's rhetorical effect of creating a community among all who heard it and mourn the dead, to Aspasia, equating her skill with what he would later call a true art of rhetoric. This shows that Aspasia was skilled in using the appeal of pathos, as she recognized her audience in mourning, and used this knowledge to create a sense of community in the oration. Additionally, Aspasia's speech follows the conventions of a classical funeral oration, drawing on rhetorical topics familiar to her audience, such as the heroic deeds of ancestors and the source of all goodness in Athenian soil. This funeral oration certainly showed that Aspasia was skilled in rhetoric, as she appealed to her audience and knew how to make her audience honor those lost in war. Finally, the Menexenus shows her skill in rhetoric, as Menexenus provides the closing frame expresses gratitude and amazement to Aspasia, saying that she must be a rare run. Aspasia's influence on rhetoric can also be seen in Cicero's De Invention with the famous engagement between Aspasia, Xenophon, and his wife. Here, Aspasia uses the rhetorical tactic of deductive reasoning. In De Invention, Socrates explains how Aspasia reasoned with Xenophon and his wife. Aspasia Please tell me, madam, if your neighbor had a better gold ornament than you have, would you prefer that one or your own? Xenophon's wife. That one. Aspasia. Now, if she had dresses and other feminine finery more expensive than you have, would you prefer yours or hers? Xenophon's wife. Hers, of course. Aspasia. Well, now, if she had a better husband than you have, would you prefer your husband or hers? At this, the woman blushed. After this exchange, Aspasia then followed this exact model, but with Xenophon himself. This shows that Aspasia was skilled in rhetoric, as she caused Xenophon and his wife to question their marriage after asking them these targeted questions. Henry says that the example of Xenophon and his wife, instructed by Aspasia, seems to have been adduced to show Aspasia's skill as a rhetorician, not as a lover. In fact, Cicero and Quintilian, who preserved this fragment, each cited it as an example of particularly fine argumentation. Henry's quote shows that Aspasia's exchange 
and day invention again proves that aspasia has a place as a skilled rhetorician in our discipline. Two other more minor examples of Aspasia's expertise in rhetoric come from Athenius' Dipnosophiste and Eschenine's Aspasia. In Dipnosophiste, there's only a brief mention of Aspasia, saying that she was Socrates' teacher in rhetoric. Though her mention here is short, it again shows that she had an impact on Socrates and increases the likelihood of her existence. In Eschenines Aspasia, Henry explains, Eschenines of Sphetos, Plato's contemporary, seems to have been the first ancient writer to create an Aspasia in whom Eros and the search for Arete are fused, and the first to have mentioned her in a positive light. By this, she means that Eschenine showed Aspasia in a positive way that reflected both her sexuality as a woman and excellence as a person in general. Henry also says that Aspasia herself does not appear here as in the, as in the Menexenus where she is quoted by Socrates. For the first and perhaps the only time in classical antiquity, the thought of Aspasia stand on a, stands on its own. Her speech is reported by a man, to be sure, but it is reported for its own sake and not primarily to attack or support a man. In fact, he may have been said to have attempted to create a female subject. This quote from Henry shows that Eschenines believed Aspasia to be so valuable as a rhetor that she could be a standalone concept, not just a woman who influenced an already great man. Equally important to Aspasia's rhetorical influence on the rhetoric and composition discipline is her influence on pedagogy. The most famous example of Aspasia as a teacher occurs through Socrates. In the Menexenus, Ronald and Ritchie note how Plato names her as his excellent mistress in the art of rhetoric. Again, they support this, saying that Socrates describes Aspasia's rhetorical genius as having made many other good speakers. In other words, Socrates treats her as a teacher of men in Athens. Socrates respects Aspasia, and it is clear that he values what Aspasia has taught him. In her in her essay titled, She Must Be a Rare One, Aspasia, Corinne in the Improvidist tra Tradition, Melissa Ionetta also argues that Aspasia was an impactful teacher to Socrates, saying, Aspasia is, Socrates remarks, an excellent speechwriter and teacher of rhetoric. Aspasia's teachings to Socrates positively influenced him so deeply that he also brought others to experience her teachings. This experience occurs in Plutarch's Lives of the Grecians and Romans, where Socrates himself would sometimes go to visit her, and some of his acquaintances with him, and those who frequented her company would carry their wives with them to listen to her, and that she had the repute of being resorted to by many of the Athenians for instruction in the art of speaking. Aspasia's teachings certainly spread further than Socrates, and she influenced other great men of classical Greece. Another support for the argument of Aspasia as teacher of rhetoric is her love interest, Pericles. Aspasia's influence on Pericles is seen through his use of her speech. Aspasia surely must have influenced Pericles in the composition of those speeches that both established him as a persuasive speaker and informed him as the most respected citizen orator of the age. Henry and Ronald and Ritchie also agree with Glenn saying that Aspasia herself has made many of the nobles into speakers, and Pericles is but one of them, and that many Athenians, including Pericles, consulted Aspasia for instruction in the art of speaking. Though Pericles was her lover, it was still unconventional of the time period for a woman to influence a man, especially so much so that he would use her work as his own. Besides the two aforementioned examples of men that Aspasia taught rhetorical tactics, she also made speakers of other men in Athens. One example of another man that Aspasia taught was Xenophon. Glenn explains this, saying, In addition to influ influencing Socrates and Plato, Aspasia also influenced Xenophon and his wife, specifically in the art of inductive argument. Aspasia taught Xenophon rhetorical tactics through using him and his wife as examples. 
Another example of Aspasia teaching is to Gorgias, a sophist. Though there is no direct evidence that Aspasia taught Gorgias, Ionetta agrees that pairing the two suggests that they influenced one another, saying, Associating Aspasia with Gorgias, her peer in the Periclean circle connects her improvisation to the sophists, their reputation for stylish excess and in extemporaneous excellence, and to the challenge their work provides to our modern notions of disciplinarity. Henry also cites another example of Aspasia as teacher in Aspenine's Aspasia. Of course, here, this shows how Socrates respected Aspasia as a teacher because, in the dialogue, Socrates converses with the wealthy Callias, who has asked him to recommend a teacher for his son. Socrates recommends Aspasia, for she had taught him. However, Henry explains how Aspasia taught Lysicles, and this example shows how Aspasia's relationship with Lysicles would have been more important to this dialogue than her relationship with Socrates, for if she could make a success out of a mediocre man, then she was truly gifted. Aspasia definitely influenced various scholars in Athens, and these are just documented examples of her teaching. She could have taught hundreds of men and women during this time without our knowing. A final support for the argument of Aspasia as teacher are paintings that depict Aspasia surrounded by men who appear to be listening to her. Below is a famous example of a painting featuring her. In this painting, Aspasia sits front and center surrounded by male counterparts. In the image, it can be assumed that Aspasia is teaching the men, as almost all of the men are actively engaged with her. Also, the men have books and paper, almost as if they are trying to record notes from Aspasia's lesson. As a hetera, Aspasia could gain men's attention through sexual ploys, but that does not appear to be happening here. In this example, Aspasia is moderately dressed and the men are not begging for her attention. Instead, the men are listening to her. This painting proves again that Aspasia was a respected teacher during this time period and her influence on rhetoric is astounding. Aspasia's role as a teacher to the men around her ref reflects practices in education today. Aspasia taught men that were her intellectual peers Though in Greece at the time, she was likely not viewed in this way. However, with our understanding of rhetoric and philosophy today, it becomes clear that Aspasia was indeed a peer to men like Socrates, Plato, Pericles, and more because of her equal contributions in the rhetoric discipline. Aspasia followed a peer-to-peer -peer teaching model that is commonly used in classrooms today. Stanford University published part of a chapter from a book by David Bowd titled, What is Peer Learning and Why is it Important? Here, Bowd explains that peer learning should be mutually beneficial and involve the sharing of knowledge, ideas, and experience between the participants. Through this definition, Aspasia shared knowledge with Socrates in a way that would have been equally beneficial for both of them. Bowd also explains that peer learning is not a single, undifferentiated educational strategy. It encompasses a broad sweep of activities, including the traditional Proctor model in which senior students tutor junior students to the more innovative learning cells in which students in the same year form partnerships to assist each other with both course content and personal concerns. Peer-to-peer -peer learning has many forms, including educational strategies like peer editing, think pair share, and group projects. Peer learning influences the rhetoric and composition discipline as these strategies have an especially important home in writing pedagogy. Peer interactions positively impact student writing experiences. In my own classroom, I frequently use peer learning in the form of think pair share where students collaborate with their seatmates to share about ideas about their work. To say that Aspasia was the inventor of peer learning would be a stretch but she can certainly be used as a model that shows the potential impact of peer interactions as she left her mark on extremely well-known Greek philosophers. Aspasia of Miletus certainly deserves a home in the rhetoric and composition discipline. 
Her skills and rhetoric are irrefutable as seen in Plato's Menexenus, Cicero's De Invention, and other texts and paintings. Furthermore, Aspasia serves as an important model for peer learning, highlighting how impactful a peer can be to another's beliefs, as Socrates repeatedly references Aspasia's influence on his own knowledge in the art of rhetoric. Finally, Aspasia also serves as a breakthrough of feminist rhetoric, as she defied the strict gender roles forced upon her in classical Greece. Aspasia's inclusion in her own classical rhetorical theory class is well earned, and other ret comp programs need to work Aspasia into their curriculum as well. This concludes my presentation for today. Thank you so much for listening, and please continue to support the Rhetoric and Composition program at the University of Finley.